Amen. Well, if you'll open the Bible in the New Testament, your copy of the Scriptures in the New Testament to John chapter 17, we're going to return to this portion of text that we've been looking at for a while now, and we're going to be looking carefully tonight at verses 6, 7, and 8. John chapter 17, verses 6 through 8. In order to see the context clearly, we're going to begin at the beginning of the chapter and read the first eight verses, but before we do that, let's bow together and ask the Lord's blessing. Our God and Father, we're thankful that we can take up Scripture. We're thankful even for the very existence of Scripture, for its preservation, for its translation, for the abundant access that we have to it, and for the blessing of gospel preaching and biblical teaching that we have in your church today. We pray, O God, that as we study Scripture this evening, that your Spirit would guide and bless us and help us that we might rightly understand all that it has to say. Help us to see more of your glory, O God, and help us to marvel at the plan of redemption established before the foundation of the world that will carry your saints even into eternal glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it. Many prayers in scripture are found uh, and they are preserved there for the sake both of the historical record that Moses or David uh, or the prophets prayed in this way and at this time, but also to illustrate for us the proper practice of prayer. And we've talked many times about the proper use of the Psalms as a manual for prayer, uh, using the prayers recorded both in the Old and New Testaments as models, as it were, uh, patterns for our own prayer, even using the language of the apostles and prophets in our own prayers. When we come to John chapter 17, though, we are looking at a prayer that we scarcely dare to pray. We're looking at something unique. We're seeing Jesus praying to his Father as the God-man. We are listening to internal communication. We are observing communion among the persons of the Trinity. And it's not to say that this prayer cannot be adapted for the church's use in our present day, but it is to say that there is something unique about it. Something unique about this prayer because Christ is praying to the Father and not just in the way that we often see him do in the four Gospels. He is praying about the covenant of redemption, as Reformed people like to call it. He's praying about this eternal plan and purpose that comes to culmination, to consummation in the work of the Son of God. It's so unique that we are entirely unable to take it up as our own. We are listening to God commune within himself, and we should marvel and wonder at the eternal, infinite majesty of the God who is revealed here. Now, in this lesson, we're looking at verses 6, 7, and 8, and we can't properly do so without reference to the preceding verses that we just read, as well as to the verses that continue from here, because these these ideas continue to be developed in the rest of the chapter In his commentary on this passage, Calvin uh, points out three steps, as it were, in these particular verses. And and I want to broadly use that framework for looking at them tonight with you. I want to do so under these three headings. uh, Chosen, committed, and converted. The disciples for whom Christ prays were first chosen by God. 
And then they were committed to the Son in his incarnation and work of redemption in order to save. And finally, they were converted by the word of God received through faith. Now, there is a particular focus in in verses 6 through 19 on the Lord's apostles and his first generation disciples. You can see that in several ways in the context. You'll see in verse 12, for instance, a distinction between those who were with Christ on the earth, a group that included for a time the son of perdition, Judas, uh, a distinction between that group and those in verse 20 who would later believe in Christ through their word. But as important as that distinction is, and we mentioned that at the beginning of our study of John chapter 17, as important as that distinction is, it's not really relevant for the ideas we're looking at in verses 6, 7, and 8. In other words, when we look at the structure of John 17 and we see that in the first five verses Christ is praying about the glory that properly belongs to him both as the eternal son of God and as the victorious son of Adam... And in verses 6 through 19, as he prays about the disciples that were immediately with him and who will serve as his ambassadors to the nations, and then in verses 20 through the end of the chapter, as he looks at the second generation of disciples, that structure is important in an overall sense. But the themes that Jesus speaks of in these verses tonight are just as applicable to future generations of disciples as they were to the apostles and first generation saints in the early church. So I want to look at these three ideas with you for just a moment. First, those for whom Christ prays are chosen by the Father. Now there there is a sharp and significant distinction between those who belong to Christ and those whom Jesus says are in the world. In fact, in verse 9, he will say, I pray for them, that is his disciples. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Very, very clear. I am praying for these and not those. I am praying for this group and not that group. Not the rest of humanity, but rather for those whom you have given me. Now it is true that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It is true that everyone who comes to Christ in faith was at one time a member of the world. One who belonged to the world which lies under the sway of the wicked one. But that's not the point that Jesus is making here. What he's talking about here is the distinct identity of those who belong to God and who would in time come to faith in Jesus Christ. And he is highlighting the fact that that group stands out within the mass of humanity. That though they may not always be recognized, that for a time they may appear within the mass of humanity, they don't belong there. They don't belong to the world. They are not of the world, even though for a time they may look like the world. They may live as of the world. But God has already marked them out for redemption. And God in time, God the Spirit, will draw them out by applying the redemptive benefits of the work of Jesus Christ. Before the sheep recognize their shepherd, they are already sheep that belong to him. You may remember that back in chapter 10, the Lord Jesus said, The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. You want to pay very careful attention to verse 26 there. Jesus does not say, you are not my sheep because you do not believe. See, that would have made sense to us. We would say, yep, got that. You don't believe, therefore you are not one of his sheep. In order to become one of his sheep, you have to believe. That is the prerequisite. That's the condition. That's the criteria. If you'll just believe, then you can become a sheep. But if you don't believe, you're going to remain a goat. That's not what Jesus says. He says, you do not believe because you are not already one of my sheep. Now, what sense does that make? Jesus is pointing out the very same truth that he's highlighting in this prayer in John 17. And that is that within the mass of humanity, there are some who are of the world. And there are some who were chosen by the Father, given to Christ, and in time will be converted unto him. Christ's sheep do not become sheep by believing. They already are sheep before they believe. Does that mean they're saved? No. No. They still have to be justified. They still have to be adopted. They still have to be sanctified. They still have to be glorified. But in the eternal plan and purpose of God, they've already been marked out for all of those blessings. Christ's sheep do not become sheep by believing. Rather, they are made known by belief. They are revealed to be his sheep through faith. But the faith only discloses what is already true. And that is that they were chosen by God before the foundation of the world. 
I want you to look again at these verses, verses 6, 7, and 8. Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. There's no other way to read this. There's no way to read this so as to support the idea that somehow the identity of persons changes on the basis of their decision, on the basis of their action. As though everyone begins life as a goat, and then some goats choose to transform themselves by their choice, by their free will action, into something else. No, no, no. Jesus says, there were disciples who belonged to the Father before they were given to the Son to save. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and that's when I gave them the truth. You say, but wait a second, it's the truth that sets you free. That's right. They're not set free until they hear that truth. They're not set free until they believe that truth. But in the mind of God, in the plan of God, in the purpose of God, they're already marked out as His. He's already marked them and said, you are mine. Oh, not yet. You just don't know it. You just don't know it. You don't know it. No one around you knows it. But one day you will hear the voice of the shepherd and you will realize what you never knew. And that is, you're not a goat. You're a sheep. You will recognize his voice. Before they knew Jesus, before they understood that he was sent by God, before they trusted in Christ at all, they already belonged to the Father. And he gave them to the Son in order that they might come to believe in him. And this is not true of the rest of the world. This is not a general blessing given to every human being. It is a special blessing. It is a covenantal blessing given to those chosen by God in Christ. And we should not make the mistake here of thinking that this only applies to the apostles. That's why we said just a moment ago, it's important to see the structure of John 17, to, to recognize the basic flow of this prayer, but to recognize these concepts, that structure is not relevant because these concepts are true of all of the disciples of Jesus, both in the first generation and in the last generation. This is not an election to service, as though Jesus is only speaking about those whom the Father gave to him to serve as ambassadors. No, what he says is he is speaking of those who come to know who he is and where he is from through faith. He says, I've given them the words that you gave to me, and they have now come to understand that everything that is mine was given to me by you. They've come to understand that I was sent by you. They've come to believe that. They've come to trust that truth. That is true of every believer. Before they believe, they are chosen by God. And why does the Father choose them? Why doesn't he choose every person in the world? You know, that's the way that some some uh, Christians have drawn out the doctrine of election. Well, maybe God chooses everyone. It's not that we opt in, it's that we opt out. <laughs> everyone begins his life as a sheep, but some sheep decide through their own free will to become goats. But that's not what Jesus says. It's not reconcilable with this passage and many others like it. We cannot know why God determines what he does except insofar as he reveals and explains himself. And in this case, he has not explained his reason for choosing to save some and not others. But what he has made clear is that it is not due to anything that is true of the elect or ever will be true of them. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, that Christ has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own power and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He saved us and called us not according to our works, not in view of what we would do, not in view of what we would one day later do after the grace becomes operative in our lives. No, he saved us and calling, called us according to his own purpose. Before time, and it was only later revealed, it came to light. It came into actuality through the end-time work of the incarnate God. It is not as a result of or in anticipation of or contingent in any way upon our works. God's choice is solely on the basis of his own purpose and grace. And this grace is appointed for the elect while they remain in unbelief. <laughs> this is what is so 
mind-boggling about all of this is that it is while we are enemies, it is while we are rebels, it is while we hate God, while we are still sinners, Christ dies for our sins, plural, Romans 5. Not just sin in general, but for every one of our sins. He dies on the cross at that time while we are sinners. God justifies not the believing, but the ungodly. That's what Romans says. The ungodly, he justifies. It's not because of us. It's because of him. The elect do not know that they are elect until they come to believe in Jesus. They do not know that they are sheep until they suddenly hear and recognize the voice of the shepherd. And you and I do not know who they are unless and until faith reveals it. And sometimes it reveals it very late. The thief on the cross, <laughs> who would have marked him out as an elect person? King Manasseh, who would have thought that he is beyond the reach of grace? Every one of us surely would have, but he was not. Calvin in his commentary here says this, quote, Christ declares that the elect always belonged to God. God therefore distinguishes them from the reprobate, not by faith or by any merit, but by pure grace. For while they are alienated from him to the utmost, still he reckons them as his own in his secret purpose, end quote. The second step we see is this, those for whom Christ prays are given to the Son to save. And so we ask the question, to whom did Christ manifest the name and the glory of God? Well, according to these verses, it was all of those who belonged to the Father and who were given by the Father to the Son to save. And we might here wonder, how could it be that some belong to the Father and not also to the Son? But that would be to misunderstand the redemptive and covenantal context of this prayer. Jesus is not saying, they belonged to you as God the Father, but not to me as the eternal and only begotten Son. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying they belong to you as the Father, and they were committed to me in the context of the Incarnation. In the context of the outworking of redemption. See, we're not looking at the ontological trinity. We're not looking at the relation of the persons of the Godhead in eternity past, so to speak. We're looking at the economic trinity. We're looking at the outworking of the redemptive purpose and plan of God, where now the Son submits to this plan, this covenant that has been formed between the Father and the Son. The Son submits in that plan to become flesh. And to the God-man is now committed by the Father these souls to redeem. In one sense, the elect always belong to the Son because they are chosen by God. And God is Father, Son, and Spirit. But Jesus is here speaking about the role that he plays as the one who becomes man in order to save man. And when Jesus came to the earth, he was on a rescue mission. And the objects of that rescue were not unknown to him. He did not come merely to find out if anyone could be saved or who might be willing to be saved. He didn't come in doubt about the outcome of this endeavor. He knew those given to him by the Father, and he knew that once given the opportunity to meet him through the gospel, they would recognize him and know him. And that's why he can say to some of his critics, you don't believe because you are not my sheep. <laughs> you don't belong to me. This is why he can say to the Pharisees in John 8, you are of your father the devil, the desires of your father you want to do. And yet he can say to others, come, come, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And he knows that the sheep will hear and respond to that call. Who will come to Christ ultimately? John 6, 37, all that the father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. And what was the Son's mission on earth? John 6, 38 through 40. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now why do some believe, but not all are those who believe better than others? No. John 8, 47. He who is of God hears God's words. And so Jesus says to his unbelieving opponents, Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. See, it has explanatory power. Jesus says those who belong to God, listen to God. That's how they are made known. 
You don't know who belongs to God. As, as Spurgeon said, you can't lift up the, the, the shirt tail and see a stripe on their back indicating the fact that, yep, there's an elect person. God hasn't given us any physical markers like that where we can see a halo. We can't drive around the neighborhoods and say, well, God is watering this person's lawn with the rain and he's withholding rain from this other. Nope, he gives to all rain and seasons. But the way you know who belongs to God is in their response to the word of God. For whom did Christ die? Was it for sin in general? Was it for everyone in the world, for every person, so that he might have an opportunity to save himself by making a decision for Christ? No. John 10, 15 and 16. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The sheep are distinct from the rest of the world, and it is for the sheep that Jesus dies. It is for the sheep that he lays down his life. It is the sheep that he comes to gather. It is the sheep that will ultimately be made into one flock and be saved. And Jesus is looking at other sheep who are not of this fold, i.e. those who are Gentiles, and he already sees them. See, he already knows who those sheep are outside of Israel, and he says, them also I must bring. He doesn't say, I suppose that possibly, perhaps, it will work out so that some among the Gentiles might want to come and join into this blessing. He says, no, I have sheep out there. I've got to go get them out there and bring them in here. He knows who they are, and he lays down his life that they might be saved. Again, John 10, 27 to 29, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. That is the promise that you have as one who belongs to God. If you are a believer in Jesus, this is the promise that the Lord Jesus makes to you. Not one of his sheep will perish. They may go through floods and fire. They may fall into ravines. They may break every one of their legs. They may become stupid and willful, and the shepherd may have to go after them and smack them in the back of the head and knock them off their feet and pick them up and carry them home, but not one of the sheep will be lost. Praise God. The love of Christ is personal and particular. He did not die to establish a blood bank to which sinners may appeal. He died for sins. Specifically, for our sins, particularly, the Bible says. He carried them in his body on the cross, Peter says. He showed his love for us. Not for all people, but for us while we were still sinners. By dying for us, Paul says in Romans 5. These statements are meaningless if the Son comes to save all men equally and in the same way. If he died for all people equally and in the same way. If the redemptive work is general and undesignated, then none of these passages in your Bible make sense. You just can't reconcile these passages of Scripture with that sort of idea. What does it say? We should not judge these statements of Scripture on the basis of our presuppositions about fairness and equality because, after all, what is fair about grace? Anyone who says, but it's not fair, is not yet in the conversation. No, 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 we are not talking about fairness because that has to do with justice. We're talking about grace. You don't want justice from God. You want grace. And grace, by definition, is unmerited and demerited. Not only do we not deserve it, we have actively done things to disqualify ourselves from it. But this is the beauty of God's grace. It is free, Romans 3.24. It is undeserved, Titus 3.3-7. It is unearned, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Grace is not an offer. It is not an invitation, and it is not an opportunity. And let me make a very important distinction here. I want this to be very clear in your minds. Grace is not an offer, an invitation, or an opportunity. The gospel gives us all of those things. Here's the distinction. If some people will take these truths about grace and they will seek to transfer them to gospel ministry, that's a misapplication. The gospel makes an offer. The gospel extends an invitation. The gospel provides an opportunity to all people. 
Come, drink, eat, receive, repent, be saved. That's the gospel. But grace, the grace of God which furnishes salvation actually accomplishes what God intends. And it is the failure to distinguish grace and gospel that leads to many soteriological errors in the visible church today. Those who receive this grace have been given by the Father to the Son to redeem, and not one of those whom He redeems will fail to come to faith or will fall away or will ever be lost. And so there is a third step. Those for whom Christ prays here are gathered by the word through faith. I want to make sure you're following this progression. Christ manifested the name of God to his disciples by giving them the words that the Father gave to him. They received those words. They came to know that Jesus was sent by the Father. That progression is crucial. There is revelation to the elect. There is reception of that revelation by the elect, resulting in knowledge of who is elect. Now, in one sense, the truth of God has been known to every person. It has been revealed to all creation. What does the Bible say? The Hebrew Bible, the Psalms, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. Everyone can see it. Everyone receives that revelation in one sense. They live in the midst of it. They are part of that general revelation of God's power as creator. And this is why Paul says in Romans chapter 1, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. All of creation has received a sort of revelation. But what Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 17 is a special covenantal knowledge that is given to the elect that is categorically different than the general natural information given to the world. And this is important. Just as we have to make distinctions between effectual saving grace and the proclamation of that grace in the gospel that is undifferentiated, so too we have to make a distinction between general revelation that imparts information and the special covenantal revelation that results in relationship, real knowledge of God and of the people of God by Him. It's one thing to say that all people know about God by virtue of creation. It is another to say that Jesus' disciples know God because they've come to trust in Jesus Christ. One is factual, the other is relational. One is general, the other is special. One is innate, the other is imparted. Everyone knows deep down that there is a God, but only those who trust in Jesus Christ personally know God. You see that distinction? Jesus uses know and believe in verse 8 in a parallel way. Did you notice this? He says, they have come to know, and then he goes on and says, that is, they have believed. And Calvin comments this way, quote, For thus he shows that nothing which relates to God can be known aright but by faith. And that in faith there is such certainty that it is justly called knowledge. Now, there, this is important not because know and believe are synonyms. They're not synonyms. But, but it is important because there are certain things we can only know when and if we believe. Credo ut intelligum. I believe in order that I may understand. In other words, the Christian does not believe in Christ because of what he knows externally apart from faith. He comes to understand spiritual truth because he believes in Jesus and therefore he comes to know him. He comes to know him, not just know about him, not just go the, know the, the facts of the gospel. No, no, he knows Jesus personally, and that's different. He comes to understand Things that he cannot see from the outside. This is not a blind faith or an uncritical acceptance of certain doctrines and dogmas. No, it is the deeper knowledge of personal relationship with Jesus. 
And that personal knowledge is not obtained through objective critical examination. It's obtained through personal trust in him as the Son of God. This is a spiritual hearing. It is hearing the gospel with faith that results in a personal relationship with the truth and life of God. And this is the point that Augustine makes in his exposition of this passage back in the 4th century. He says this, quote, He had given them, therefore, as he said, the words which the Father gave him. But when at length they received them spiritually, not in an outward way with their ears, but inwardly in their hearts, then they truly received them. For then they truly knew them. And they truly knew them because they truly believed. <laughs> End quote. That, so Augustine, he gets this idea. He says, these are the things, they know God because they believe him. And there is a, there is a kind of knowledge that only lies on the other side of faith. And no, it's not check your brain at the door. No, it's not close your eyes, put your hand over your heart, and jump out into the abyss and hope that you land on something. No, no, no. That's not what we're talking about. But we're saying that there is a knowledge that is given to the people of God by the Son of God that only comes through faith. And you can't stand out as an observer and say, just show me the facts. Tell me enough about God, and then I will finally know God in that, in that manner. No, no, no. You can only know him through faith. We know Jesus by believing in him, and if we refuse to believe in him, we will never truly know him. Those chosen by God for salvation are gathered in the fold through hearing the gospel with faith. Christ's sheep will hear him and believe. As we saw in John 6.37, 6.39, 8.47, 10.27, as we learn in many other texts, not one of those who are chosen by God will fail to believe the gospel, and not one of them will fall away from grace. Nor will any of them be saved without faith in the gospel. The word of God is the means by which Christ calls his sheep to himself. It is the mechanism by which they are drawn out of the world and brought into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is where so often misunderstanding of this doctrine results in a, a rather foolish objection to it. People will say, if God has chosen those whom he will save, why preach the gospel at all? But of course, God has chosen that his people will be saved through the preaching of the gospel. And so we might turn that objection around and ask, if God has not determined persons to save, why preach the gospel at all? Because we have no guarantee that anyone will ever believe it and be saved. This is, this is at least potentially a pointless exercise. You're simply playing the odds. You're hoping that someone is going to accept your presentation. But isn't it possible that no one ever will? The effectiveness of the gospel is the power of God into salvation does not depend upon the speaker or the hearer. It depends on God who has mercy. And so the disciples of Christ were and are chosen by God, committed to the Son by the Father, and then converted by hearing the word of God and believing in him. This was true of the apostles of our Lord, all of them except Judas, and it is true of every true disciple before and since. As Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, the Lord knows those who are his, and this is why they will be gathered. When a person hears the gospel and trusts in Jesus Christ, God is not meeting him for the first time. It may be the first time that the convert has heard the name of Christ, but it is not the first time God knew his or her name. God is not learning who will be saved by the work of his son, and he did not look down the corridors of time in order to choose those whom he foresaw would believe. If he did then salvation would be based on our choice, not on his. It would be based on our works of perseverance, not on Christ. God's grace would depend on my qualification and participation, and then grace would no longer be grace. Thank God that's not the case. And you, who are here on a Sunday night, the week of Christmas, this is the hardcore crowd, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you know that the Father sent him into the world to be the Savior of sinners? And of course you do, that's why you're here. Then praise God for the efficacious grace which enabled you to hear the gospel in faith and be converted by it. Because you do not know how many countless thousands have heard that gospel and walked away in unbelief, have rejected it and rejected every day. Thank God for the grace that changed your heart, that opened your eyes, that gave you ears to hear, 
that warmed your heart by the love of God so that you now knew that you loved Him in return. Thank God that He chose you before the foundation of the world and committed you and your sins to the Son to deal with in His death and resurrection. And do not object to the seeming unfairness of the grace that has saved you. Rather, rejoice in the God who loved you in this way and who did what is necessary in the person of Christ to deliver you from sin and to save you from the judgment to come. Let's bow together. Our great God and Father, we do thank you for these blessings. We cannot wrap our minds around them. We confess that they far exceed our grasp. How you have loved us, why you would. Oh God, that you did. We will forever thank you. Thank you, O oh Lord, for sending your Son as Savior. O oh Lord, thank you for committing your people to Him to redeem. Thank you, Lord, for sending forth your Spirit along with the Gospel so that as we heard the word of truth, we might believe. We might hear your voice and we might respond to your love by loving you. Thank you, O oh God, for doing what is necessary to wake us from the sleep of death and to bring us to yourself as your sons and daughters. Help us to grow every day in our love and appreciation for this grace. Watch over us, we pray, and keep us to the end. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let's take our hymnal and turn to our closing hymn this evening.